Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from City Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today in the captain's chairs, my UK connection, Simon Bray, and of course, Stephen Reed. It's all about UK hard rock act, melodic rock act, FM. Uh, I don't know anything about this band. I've never listened to this band. These guys are both big fans. They're well-versed in FM. So uh, I'm going to let them kind of steer you through this ranking. What do we got? 11 albums, guys? Something like that? Yep. 11 albums. Uh, they're both going to give you a little bit of info on the band. So uh, uh, Simon or Steven, uh, whichever one of you guys want to start off and uh, just give a little background. Steven, go ahead. Go ahead. And then Simon, and then we'll get to the rankings. Go for well, it. Go for on it. Your okay, no, I, I'll, I'll throw out there right from the very start and suggest that FM are possibly the UK's best AOR act ever. Do you know, there's, there's not a huge amount of competition, to be fair. There's lots of good AOR acts that have come from the UK. Most of them lasted for an album or two. FM lasted for four, and then they split up again in 1995. They formed in the mid-80s. They kind of started out as a band called Wildlife. Okay, so this is their second album. This is a self-titled one, which came out in 1983. And you've got the Overland Brothers here. So you've got Steve, and you've got... Chris, so vocalist and guitarist, lead guitarist. You've also got on here Simon Kirk. Yes, Simon Kirk, the drummer from Free. Uh, and you've also got Phil Suzanne, who people will know from like the Ozzy Osbourne on bass on this. And as well as also mentioned Mark Booty on keyboards, who I doubt anybody will know very much about because I don't, I'm willing to learn. So I'm sure somebody can, can you know, school me on Mark Booty a little bit. Uh, so they split in 1985, they reformed again in 2007 um, because they were pleaded to by Firefest, the UK festival that was run by Fireworks magazine, who I am lucky enough to write for. Um, and they were given such a rapturous reception that they kind of went, oh, maybe we should never split up. So they reformed uh, and then they headlined the festival again two years later, released a comeback album in 2010 and have released new music at really quite a rate since then. EPs, albums, you name it, every year, every couple of years, there's something new from them. And they've been universally really quite good. So anyway, I'll be quiet. Go on, Simon. Sorry, I've taken all of that. It's <laughs> good, that's good, yeah. Um, I, I would suggest that they started out as a, as a melodic rock kind of act. You know, the, the first two albums were just like super shiny, uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss later. But no, no, I think they're quite a... English kind of take on melodic, hardish kind of rock, you know. Um, nowhere near metal or anything like that, but you know, they're they just are FM, you know what I mean. And you know, the common thread is the what is the vocalist Steve, Steve Overland. I just think he's a fantastic vocalist, I think he's absolutely astonishing. And if you think that once they supported Bon Jovi and you think and you listen to Bon Jovi now. And you listen to and you listen to Steve Orville and you think, shit, you know, he yeah. must be approaching his sixties, mustn't he? You know, or, in, or my age in his mid fifties, and he's he's absolutely just brilliant. They are an excellent live act. They do tour, they tour a lot. Um, I first saw them in nineteen ninety ish when I was at university in Cardiff, and they were playing quite large venues. They didn't sell out. But I've seen them make their way back up to, you know, medium-sized venues like Academy Two in Manchester. Although bizarrely, later this year they're playing Water the Waterloo in Blackpool, which essentially is a pub. Yeah, that's a bit weird. Tiny, tiny venue, but I'm sure it'll be absolutely awesome um, yeah. within it. Now going back to Mr. Overland, he has his own specific kind of um, traits. You know, I wonder if he gets up in the morning and Miss Mrs. Overland says. Um, do you want a cappuccino? I'll go, yeah, yeah, because he does it <laughs> practically. It feels like every song. Am I all right, Stephen? Am I all right? Yeah, I was actually going to mention that. I think if you look right. up the Guinness World Records book, that you'll find Steve Overland under the section of most song intros that go, mm, or, ah, yeah. or, mm, whoa. Or, yeah. or, I think <laughs> that is a ratio of probably one in three. Yeah. that you know he's going to hmm his way into it somewhere, you know? But I have to say, every one of them, you think, oh, wow, that was good. <laughs> so, he, but yeah. He does it because he can. Because he's yeah. just trying to And I would echo what you said. In fact, about the product, they have put a 
an immense amount of product in the last 14 years. And I would suggest that some of the EPs are arguably better than some of the some of the albums because uh, there's loads of um, live cuts and other fun stuff with the main part. You know, the, the EPs are just excellent and they've put out a fair amount of live albums recently. The uh, Tough It Out live album is magnificent. Really, maybe at the at the end of the episodes for someone like me, um, who I you know me, I'm always willing to try something new. Uh, maybe you can let me know like what a great like do they have like a the live album from them? Like do they have like a killer live album that would be a good mm -hmm. place to start? Do you think? You don't have to tell me now. You can think about it maybe at the end of the episode. So I just named it. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this sounds this sounds like something I can't I can't pass up, and uh, you know I I'm I'm a sucker for good, really good melodic rock, and uh, you know, the, 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 you Brits can do that stuff pretty pretty good, I think. So uh, I'm all for it. What so, I am prepared to say, sorry, sorry, Simon, you go. What I am prepared to say is that um, I don't I love them, but I'm not completely uncritical about them, and I I personally think there are a couple of clunkers in their oeuvre. Mm. That will be um, some of the music of all time. <laughs> I love their logo. The logo is absolutely amazing. I, I always thought yeah. their logo was great. Yeah, yeah. That, that's and the cool. stuff with it, which I like as well. Yeah. Oh, and as um, we're con contractually obliged to do, this is not the uh, Canadian FM. Yes. The Progressive Rock Act. Not. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the, no Nash the Slash in this band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. So the other thing I was going to mention before we actually talk about the albums, sorry everybody, I think we've been on for about half an hour, we've not even spoken about an album yet, uh, is that Pete Jupp, who is the drummer, he's excellent. Um, for UK viewers, he looks a bit like a dishevelled James Nesbitt. Um, just slightly... He's not seen better days. He's a lovely, beautiful looking gentleman, but he was more beautiful back in the day. There you go. See, he doesn't look like that now. And yeah, Merv, Merv Goldsworthy, which uh, that's a great name. That's a great name. They both were in Sa uh, Samson for a very short period of time prior to FM as well. So a bit of heavy metal um, kudos to them as well for that. Pete Jupp, supposedly, when they tour uh, in Central Europe, gets, still gets asked to sign a lot of Samson albums. I believe so. A bit of kudos to them for that as well. But anyway, we should talk about some music. <laughs> we should. Well, right, Simon, Simon, someone stay. Simon, start off. Simon, oh, Simon says number eleven is. Um, um, you know, I've made this list, and um, <laughs> like, like, like we did with Survivor, I've moved them up and down, and everything. Um, my least favorite FM, FM album is Dead Man's Shoes. Have you got it? Of course you have. It's actually quite difficult to get. It is now, yeah. It is now. It's a pretty obscure album on a pretty obscure record label. Um, you could tell by the um, at the time that they were kind of losing their way. They were the wrong band, wrong time. Um, in Was it 1995, I think? Yep, 95, yep. Do you know if I have to... You, this, is, this is the theme of everything I ever say. Uh, Covers of soul classics like "Get Ready" is on this album. It just no, no. There's so much, so many better albums for you to in in this band's uh, catalog. So just no, this one. Yeah, number eleven for me, and that's why it was so easy to find is "Dead Man's Shoes." Uh, and Simon has absolutely nailed it there. Absolutely nailed it. Um, it was the debut of Jim Davis, uh, the current keyboard player. It's the album just before they split up. Uh, and as Simon says, you could sense it coming more than anything else. When we did that Thunder show a few weeks ago, Pete, I mentioned that they kind of lost their way and started to do kind of funky blues soul sort of covers. FM went through that similar sort of short phase where you kind of thought, yeah, I know that those influences are there. I don't need to hear you doing these great songs like that. Though. So yeah, Get Ready's on here. It's, it's a bit weird choice. I mean, Overland sings it fantastically but here you go I think it's a bit bluesier as well in places than they'd been early on it's just kind of searching for, for what it's meant to be sister tattoo needle if you're looking for highlights that's them but I'm looking for highlights here to be fair so this is a really strong catalogue but as Simon says whether we'll agree on them or not there are a couple of albums that to me and this is one of them dead man's shoes it's hard to find but I think that's probably just because it's never been reissued I would guess there you go okay cool. Just so you know, I have picked up a couple more thunders, just so you know. 
Very good. And just as a complete aside, you knew, you know the new Thunder album. It's in the yes. Deck, yeah. And you've seen the really co cool cover. Yeah. I could drive there within ten minutes. Really? The location? Wow. Yes. Pretty neat. Well, we need to, we need to see an album cover. We need to see you in the album cover now, Simon, don't we? So what, I'll see what I can do. Okay. Next time. That is your assignment for next time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Right. So number 10 for me is um, taking it to the street. Street, sir. Uh, I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. I've, now I've been re-listening to it. And I don't know if it's Andy Barnett in his guitar playing, but I just know... Um, I don't need a ballad that sounds like uh, Mr. Big, you know, only the strong survive. Um, it's it's a completely different band from the first two albums. You know, you, you can tell that, I, that they must have gone, shit, we didn't sell anything there, really. And the musical landscape keeps changing and, mm, I, you know, I, it sounds awful now. I didn't like it then. I've got it on vinyl and it just doesn't sound any better. And do you know what? There's a cover of I Heard It Through the Grapevine, which they always play when I go to see them. Yeah, they do, don't they? Right. I mean, yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. yeah we, do, we do like this band, Peter. We do actually like this band. I hope so. <laughs> Everything else I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I've gone somewhere else. I understand where Simon's coming from. I enjoy that album a little bit more than I did when it first came out. So number 10 for me, and I don't like doing this either, uh, and it's not a habit of mine, is actually the most recent. This is Synchronicity from 2020. Uh, album number 11, Got a great cover, great back, and it's probably the only FM album where I kind of think, you know, ah, that sounds a bit like Ride Like the Wind by Christopher Cross, or this one sounds a little bit like Mr. Mister. I think it was a keyboard section where I immediately went, oh, Little Angels. Um, and for a band as good as this, I didn't really need that to be there in that sense. There's good stuff on here, Angels Cried. It's a bit like Thunder in slow mode. End of Days, it's a great mix of guitars and keyboards on here. It's not. A, it's an album I enjoy when I'm listening to it. Once it's finished, I'm singing other FM songs or I'm singing other band songs personally. So it's number 10 for me, Synchronicity. Doesn't quite really do it for me. No. Uh, number nine for me, 2013, in a blast of creativity, they released two albums, Rockville 1 and Rockville 2. And I've gone for Rockville 1. <laughs> Just trying to catch me out there. It, now, now, I mean, now we're into the good stuff. It's not, it's not absolute classic, but it's good. It's all good. Um, story of my life. I've no idea that wasn't a hit. You know, it's really quite soulful. Crosstown trains, quite rocking. It's a right. It's a, oh God, I sound very northern. It's a right grower of a record. You know, it's a grower. It's oh. a good. It, you know, you put it on and you listen to from what, from start to end, and it grows on you. And uh, it doesn't, it's, um, like most of their most recent stuff, it's a really muscular kind of production. Um, I'm not confident that I like muscular kind of productions where everything's so big and right at you. But, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. But, you know, there's some really excellent songs on there. I crave, show me the way. Some really, you know, proper melodic rock with loads of woes. And uh, it's, good. it's good, it's good, good stuff. Good stuff, marginally. Not quite as good as Rockville 2. Well, that's interesting because my next one is Rockville 2. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, you see. And that shows you that I think that the Reformation albums, if there's a criticism I would make of FM since they came back, is that they're remarkably consistent. That's obviously a plus point. That's obviously a good thing. Mm. But I do think that there's maybe not a formula. That would be unkind. But I do think that the albums of they're very much from the same sort of ilk. They kind of come from the same sort of place. So Simon says 2013, they released Rockville. But because they had so many great songs, they also released Rockville 2 in the same year. Uh, and some of the EPs that we spoke about earlier are actually long enough to be album length. And I think they only called them EPs rather than release two albums a year like bands did back in the 70s. Why they didn't just release two albums a year and say, you know, we're just that good. I don't know. But... Anyway, Rockville 2, this is, this is really good. As Simon says, we're already, although we've not agreed on everything yet, we're already in the, the stage where I think I really quite like these albums now. Um, same again, yeah, I would agree with the, the productions, maybe not. It's a bit modern for the style of music in, in some places, I would suggest is maybe the best way of doing it. It's kind of all turned up to the max a little bit. 
but the vocals cut through, and it's worth mentioning that Jim Kirkpatrick, who's the guitarist since they've come back, he's really top notch. He, you know, he can rip out a riff. He can really send out some searing solos. Uh, he's just got some great groove and great feel as well. He's a real talent, that has to be said. I don't really quite know where he came from, what he was doing before, but he's been with the band all the way through since they, since they started to record in, in the reformation years. Andy Barnett did start with them back in, in Firefest, but didn't come out after that. And I think probably one of the reasons that they've lasted as long is because they found a guitarist that just seems to click in in such a way. And I think he's the standout on this album, but it's not a personal standout album for me, for Phil 2. Which is my number eight. Uh, and I've uh, noted the guitars. What, what they do, what they've always done, though, is they occasionally just bring out the twin guitars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, got, it's like not quite into Thin Lizzy, which is one more, but they, they, they do. And, you know, when, you, 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 very often when you, watch, when you watch them live, you'll play the guitar and sling it down and do, do the whole microphone thing. And I think the guitars on this are just excellent. And I would absolutely point out the song Guilty. On this one, I think on most of the records they've got one song that's like ultra commercial, really sing along and uh, guilt is the key, absolutely the key tune on this one, um, as opposed to Runaway Train, which is really dull. But you know, it is a good oh. record. It's a good, it's a good record. It's, it's oh, a good record. There's, there's disagreement in the camp. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> A runaway train fan is that what the name of the song is? Runaway train. Yeah, I like Runaway Train. It's not as good as Cross Down Train, which is on a different album, but it's I like that song. Yeah, it's <sighs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> He's on that train and gone. <laughs> well, you know what I always say: these things hear things differently, right? So Absolutely. That's that's why these are so fun to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So where are we at? Number eight, me. Yeah. Here we go. So, another cracking album cover. I have to yeah. say, this is Atomic Generation. So, this is the band's 10th album. Um, and I mean, as Simon's just said, standout tracks, they do a standout track and, and they do, I think they also choose their lead tracks. Well, we were talking earlier about bands doing lead tracks and various things before we, we, we started recording there. And it seems to be a thing now where you know, bands often don't necessarily represent the album in the right way sometimes. I think FM do. Um, I think they're quite good at, at picking an upbeat track that really hooks you in and think, oh, this album's going to have something to say for itself. Killed by Love is the track on this album for me that does that. It's just got a great vocal, it's got a killer chorus, sticks in the mind. But the stuff on here, like Make the Best of What You Got, which has got a real great attitude to it. Um, too Much of a Good Thing, that's another highlight. And this is a really good album. It's really strong. And we're at a stage now where we may not be choosing them in the same order, but, you know, I would put this on any day that we can love it. So this is really good. Um, and yeah, they're much more of a rocky band, I think, in the last five, ten years than, than they were before, you know. Um, but it suits them. And when you've got a singer as good as Steve Overland, I mean, the, the guy can sing anything, you know. So that's Atomic Generation is my number eight. That cover is very ten-ish. There's an element of that too, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. I really quite like it. And there's a little bit of a theme in some of the later covers, which I quite like too. Excuse me, diving off here. So there's oh, yeah, yeah. these kind of theme together. And then there's also, you could add in to that as well. Yep. And, and I'm a sucker for that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was the guy who was buying all the Def Leppard singles that joined together and all this sort of thing. So <laughs> I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. Of so, course yeah. you are. Yep. <laughs> Still have them. <laughs> there you go. Right. Sorry. Like therapy, this yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah, my number seven is synchronized. In my in my day job, I might teach English language, and I want to know why this has got a Z in it in synchronized because we're English. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, uh, yeah. The title track itself is awesome. I had never noticed that. I had never noticed that. There you go. There you go. Um, Superstar is a great track on this one and I love the way they, that they rhyme Superstar with Jaguar. Thumbs up. Double thumbs up for that one as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I would suggest that this play, that this album um, places them firmly in the category of dad rock. Dad rock. Dad rock. <laughs> yeah. And that is not a bad thing. 
It really isn't. It really, you know, it's uh, it's a bit Richard Mikesish, Mikesish, Richard Mikesy nicey. <laughs> that is a, that is a good thing. That's that is also that's also uh, a good thing as well. Um, it's a pretty contemporary sounding album um, with a big production, and like I said, it's, it's it's a good record. It's just nice. It's a nice record. You like like you just said, Steve. You, you can put it on and just think, I'm gonna have a good time for the next forty odd minutes. Really oh. good. To put in the car. But, no, let's not go out in the car because it's peeing down. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's I, do my like, I do like that Richard Marxist though. That must be music for the people. That's that's. That, I'm definitely, I'm definitely in for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving uh, you, along. I, I love hanging with you too, man. Can we do this. Like, <laughs> this is this like this is so entertaining for me. <laughs> I could just sit back and just listen to you guys talk all night. Good. <laughs> And if you're struggling, you can put out the bat signal for us as well, Peter. There, there you go. go. All right, cool. There we go. <laughs> so my number seven is Metropolis. This was the band's comeback album. Um, this was the first one with Jim Kirkpatrick on it. Um, first album in 15 years. And I've got to say that, that Jupp and Goldsworthy, the rhythm section, they turn up on this album while they're good on this. Um, just everything seems to thump and bump in all the right kind of ways. To you know, that's always a good thing. Uh, but it's just such a strong album. Wild Side is such a great opener, it has to be said, and such a good vocal. I would sing it for you, but Steve would probably sue, you know, because obviously he'd be stealing my licks after that. Mm, oh, and all of those things. Um, but it's just such a good album. I, I really like this one. Um, and it was... So many bands have made comebacks and you put their comeback album on and you think, mm, well, mm, not this. This is such a solid album, so good. And a little bit of, of a, a departure, I was a little, not worried, but in between times, the only thing we really got from anybody was, was the So album from Steve Overland and Pete Jupp is on here too. Uh, and this was really smooth. I've got two versions because they're different, but also because this was, this is cheap and cheerful. I have to show this. This is why I dug this out. Okay, so. You've got your booklet, but you don't really have your booklet because it does that. Okay, so you've, okay, and the lyrics are on here. Okay, now, even if I hold them right up to the screen, can, can you read these? I don't think so, it's in the, I mean, that shows you where this style of music was at, you know, at this stage, but, but there you go. So then it also it doesn't really play anymore. It's not a real CD. So they reissued it. So anyway, coming from there to Metropolis was kind of like FM or back, do you know? The folks um, watching, he's not telling you, but he actually has a third and a fourth copy of that socked away somewhere that he's not telling you about. So, And he's laughing because he knows it's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> With certain acts, it definitely is. Yes, absolutely. I, I know. <laughs> no two ways about it. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm saying nothing. Anyway, sorry. Sidetrack, it's not like me, is it? Do you know? But, it, but there you go. So yes, my number seven is Metropolis. Six, Atomic Generation. Again, with a big production. I think Atomic Generation is an amalgamation of everything that's good about this band. And uh, uh, particularly, like you said, Stephen, Killed by Love. What a tune. What an absolute tune. And the have you, have you, have you seen the video for the live version? It's just yeah. tremendous. He said, they do the war, war, wars with the crowd, and then Steve, Steve Orman goes, this is fun. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you think you could probably do it every night, Steve. You know, <laughs> exactly. Right. How much fun could it possibly be after all that? So, time, just right? getting a bunch of people to go war, <laughs> war twice. But it is a fantastic tune. And uh, playing tricks on me is just so soulful. Really, really soulful. So much more soulful than the, I don't know a cover of I've Heard It Through the Great Line. So much more soulful, an original song. Um, just a really excellent album. And yet only, I think, number six for me. So, you know, I think the quality is going way. Well, I think my credibility is just going through the floor because my number six is actually taking it to the streets. And, you know, I hear you, Simon. I really do. And, and FM went through a really hard time in the UK press uh, with this album in uh, Dead Man's Shoes. And, yeah, rightly so. They started as a really smooth, clean-cut AOR band. I mean, it really was kind of keys over guitars, 
not all the time, and, and Chris Overland can, can certainly play, but they, they really were that kind of, you know, all about the melody, all about the chorus. And they did evolve very quickly and probably not the way that most people expected them to. And I must admit that over the years, this is one of these albums that I've kind of think, you know what, I should put that on to see if it's as bad as I think it is. And it actually isn't. Now, I know you're going to disagree with me, Simon, because you already have, do you know, you already, as if, do you know, but if you take Heard It Through the Grapevine off this, it's really quite good. But I mean, if you add it on, I have to take stars off. <laughs> do you know? It's one of those, and people, are, I don't know if people are going to love it or hate it in the comments. I mean, we're very intrigued and they do still play it live. And whether it's a vocal showcase because Steve sings it so well, but as you say, they've got such good soulful rock songs of their own. It really doesn't need to, do you know? But things like um, Dangerous Ground, I'm Ready, I really like these songs. And Andy Barnett actually plays really well on this. And he got a really hard time. He was, the press in the UK was all, he's a wrong guitarist. He doesn't suit the band. He's changed their sound. Arguably, all of those things were correct. And this is maybe my favourite FM album that doesn't really sound like FM. Do you know? Is that unkind? I don't know. But it's number six. So it's not quite my top half, but I still really like taking it to the streets. And more than I thought I did. So there you go. I've heard what you're saying. <laughs> I'm yes. moving on. Um, <laughs> my, my five is um, Metropolis. Send up the bat signal, as it were. You know, when we talk about them pull, uh, picking the singles, they really, really hit it out of the park with this one because they actually got airplay in the UK with um, Hollow and Bring Back Yesterday. They're on Radio 2. I mean, not that I've ever listened to Radio 2 since about 1975, but nonetheless, you know, that, that usually guarantees some form of hit, hit record, doesn't it, in this country? It does. That, that kind of constitutes popular now, it has to be said. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I think what well, they chart at something not very high. I mean, they've, they've, you know, I think in many ways we are delving into the obscure here, aren't we? Because, you know, they put out 11 albums and haven't exactly sold millions, but they're great. You know, yeah. this is this is an excellent album. And the first five songs are um, really, really good. Top-notch stuff. I particularly like Flamingo Road. That's an absolute, absolute winner. But, um, yeah, what a comeback. What a comeback. And like you say, some comeback, comebacks you think, yeah, don't like it. But this one's just, it's just really <laughs> out of the park. Yeah. You're using Americanism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to make you feel at home here, Peter. That's all. I know, hey, guy, you guys are great. Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> so number five for me is Aphrodisiac. Okay, so this is... We're all the way back to 1992, you can tell from the bigger format here. And yet, I mean, you've got to see some of the, the band shots, do you know? Obviously these guys are, you know, cool and all the way from the USA, judging by that look, do you know? How long did they have to find someone that it wasn't raining for the photo shoot? I don't know. Um, but such, such a cool release. Oh, I forgot about that on the end as well. Some nice caricatures nice, wow. nice. of the band as well. So this, yeah, so 1992, Andy Barnett's second album and Tony Mitman or Mitman on keyboards. That's his only album with, with a band. Oh, Tony Mitman. Tony Mitman, he's there. There he is. Look at that. There, there you go. go. There Romeo's is. daughter, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they supported FM on one of the tours, didn't they? Is that right? About 38 tours, yeah. I've seen them <laughs> together a few times, yeah. <laughs> They're another underrated band as well, Romeo's. They are a fantastic band. I love that band. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, after Dizziak, it's a, we're in we're in real terms now. Do you know, I, I really like this album. Um, such a strong album. Closer to Heaven, um, Blood and Gasoline. Oh, there's a song. That's a great song. Do you know? I think we're closer to Heaven. There's maybe a kind of a southern vibe to it, not a southern UK vibe. I may add. Mm. Um, <laughs> So, you know, anyway, sorry. Um, and it's kind of a sign of things to come because that's something that's actually kind of reared its head a little bit more, I think, in the, the newer albums. They kind of add that little bit of a maybe sort of a southern vibe and maybe a bit of a country vibe in the kind of modern way that a lot of bands do. And they do it really well. But All or Nothing, such a good album this is. I, I really like this. We're really 
in the sweet spot now, I think. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Aphrodisiac's my number five. I like the rhino well, cover. Pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. I had a t shirt of that many moons ago, but where, where that's gone, I don't know. It was somebody smaller than me that bought it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had that T-shirt and it, it rotted. I wore it that much, yeah. Which is bizarre because at the time, and it's my number four, I didn't really like that album. But oh. I, it's just so it's just over the years, you know, it, it's absolutely just grown on me. Like like you say, um, close to heaven, bam! What a tune. Uh, Big soulful re- record, you know, standing at the crossroads. Um, the harmonica on played out, it's tremendous, all or nothing. It's just, I remember hating this record when it came out, mainly because it wasn't the you know, the first two. Uh, and it's actually a great record, and you know, Andy Barnett, wow, yeah, plays the shit out of it on this record, doesn't he? All the time, you know. You've, you've seen the picture. I think he's the man that was uh, that Spinal Tap were thinking of when they said dress like an Australian's nightmare. And I'm sure that's part of why I didn't really love it. But he was so good on this record. <laughs> oh, so good. It's an excellent record. I'm pleased that I went back and listened to it um, every day for the last couple of months since we started doing this. <laughs> See, I wonder if the fact that it grew on you so much is why the T-shirt rotted. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so you remember, I remember those days where, you know, where, uh, for me, especially where I had a hell of a lot less band shirts than I do now. And I would just wear this, you know, you had like maybe 20 in your in your collection in your wardrobe and you just wore them constantly one after another for month after month, year after year. And then at some point, all of a sudden, you notice like the sleeve falls off and one string all of a sudden unravels and then half the back is off. And you're like, well, time for the garbage bin. And I think back at all those great shirts that I overwore back then, which I wish I still had. So, yeah, they, they eventually do disintegrate if you wear them way too much. Now I have so many, I can never wear them too much because I'll wear this. I may not wear this again in two years, right? So it's, you know, yeah. I have it's a bit of a badge when your black T-shirt was nearly white. <laughs> washed that often that it was nearly white. And I mean, oh, back in the day, I was working night shift in a store. So you carried lots of boxes. So all my T-shirts had holes down here somewhere. Because all these boxes rubbing against them all the time. Because I just, I mean, nothing has changed. But if you saw me, I was wearing a band T-shirt. Admittedly, now it's bands and comics. Um, but yeah, if you saw me, I was. I'm always been dressed from the house up gig, uh, and I continue to be from from this day onwards. That'll, that'll never change. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> I, just, I mean, even if there's another another gig after all this COVID nonsense, then I've still got enough T-shirts to keep doing that. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So number four for me is 2015's Heroes and Villains, which is, yes, another cracking cover as well. Um, this is great. This is a really good album. The energy on this album is really good. It's an upbeat album. I mean, they've got some great ballads as well. We haven't maybe spoken about that as much as we maybe should. Um, great ballads uh, in this band, but some days I want to rock and roll. There's a chorus, do you know? Um, and you fit all those words in and you can still sing them, or Steve can still sing them anyway. Um, Digging Up the Dirt, that's a great song as well. Uh, Walking with Angels, oh, see, that's, that, there's a proper ballad. It's got great strings, real atmosphere. Fire and Rain's got a cool vibe. Yeah, I love this. Do you know, we're more into melodic hard rock than we are melodic rock, I would say, at, at this stage. But this, this is a great album, I have to say. Um, it's more than my number four, but this is maybe a good starting point, I think. Um, it's so catchy, so memorable. And I think it's a good snapshot of what the band are doing now. So yeah, my number four is Heroes and Villains. So I'm sitting here trying to decipher what my first entry would be into this catalogue. And uh, sounds like that may be a good one. Although you guys have both said really great things about Metropolis that I think really have resonated with me. So uh, I'll make a decision at the end of the show, I'm sure. Okay. Okay. Heroes and Villains is my number three. And at the risk of being completely meta, I went back to my review of it from the www.cftranquility.org. And uh, <laughs> I've gone there a few times. It's a pretty good website. It's a good one. And what I noted about that when I gave it four stars six years ago uh, with spot on guitars, it's a little bit more groove based as well. Um, digging up dirt is 
riff based bam yeah best thing about me well that's you what a tune uh, only one of rock and roll absolutely like you say you know the, the, there's some a bit like 10 there's one commercial ultra commercial song on every, on every album you know ultra 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 commercial which is weird because they've never even approached a hit but you think why is that not a hit you know why is that not on smooth fm every two seconds alongside luther vandross or whatever um and heroes and villains you know to be so deep into the korean produced album like that is just astonishingly good it's a great record interesting you saying there about them never having a hit i mean they came close i think they brushed the charts probably both sides of the reformation but i do think that they maybe tried a little too hard when they'd first yeah and 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 it seemed to be there was a desperation to get the hit and then i think now when actually as you said they've been on radio two and and things like that which is arguably where their audience would be in the uk now but and don't get me and i i mean this in in the you know the purest of ways steve overland's a good looking chap but if he was to take his leather jacket off he looks like your uncle do you know do you know what that's now he's got short hair yeah, with the yeah. beautifully coiffured short grey hair. I mean, I'm obviously jealous because I couldn't part this if my life depended on it. But, yeah. you know, and I, and I don't know if that's maybe held them back just ever so slightly because it's not the music. It's definitely mm. not the music, you know. But there's plenty of great bands that never had a hit that should have done, you know. So my number three, which was came way too early in your list, Simon, not that I'm disagreeing with your list, but obviously Rockville deserves to be at number three. That's why when you mentioned these two albums earlier, I pulled the Rockville 2, because this is the one that should be higher up the list, you know? And the reason it should be higher up the list is because it's got Crosstown Train on it, which is one of the best songs that they've put out since they've come back. I can sing it in my head right now. I won't sing it out loud right now. Oh, it's just so good. Only Foolin', so, uh, excuse me, Tough Love, uh, which opens this album up. Only Foolin', such a good song. I, I crave... I just love the vibe of this album. It's just so strong. And this to me is the best album since they've come back. Do you know? There's not a weak moment anywhere. It's a bit more grown up, maybe, um, a bit like myself. Um, and I don't know, I just really like this one. But really, everything post Reformation, it's worth a listen. But this is the one I keep going back to. Did they record that one at the same sessions as the first part, or they did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, there was really only, I think, three or four months, maybe four or five months between the two albums, um, both in 2013. And I think that they just got in the groove of recording a lot of songs when they did the albums at that stage, because as I say, most of, I think the first four or five albums since they've come back have all been accompanied by some sort of, you know, sister release, whether it's been an EP, but by EP, we're talking nine, 10, 11 songs on them, and yeah couple of live tracks but lots of new stuff in there too and a couple of remixes and things to make it worth the money but they are worth the money and as Simon said earlier on it's one of those times where you think well, why didn't that get on the album do you know um, and if anything they've maybe been guilty and this is a strange complaint of releasing too much good music in too short a space of time do you know could they have released maybe four albums that were just off the charts they maybe could have done you know, they, they maybe could have done. But while I take quality, that happens to come in quantity. But yes, I probably will, to be honest with you, because I've still got all of these great songs and lots of other really good songs too. So I'm not going to complain about too much FM because I can't have too much FM. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at their uh, on their Wikipedia page and, you know, Metropolis 2010, Rockville 2013, Rockville 2 2013, Heroes and Villains 2015, Indiscreet 30 2016, Atomic Generation 2018, Synchronized 2020, that's a lot. Yeah. Then go look at the EPs. Go look at the EPs as well, Peter, because they are all just about album length. And you'll see, you know, the period of time as well. I didn't bring them through with me today, but yeah. it's it was a it's a crazy period of time where they're just so prolific. Yeah. And yeah. you would you would guess that some of that would be just filler nonsense. And it really isn't. It really isn't. The EPs are just as exciting, if not more so than one or two of the albums. It's crazy. Mm. Oh, wow, Steve Overland's been having his solo career on Escape Music, hasn't he? And they're yeah. just br- 
brilliant. Epic is like actually the best FM album for the last 30 years. That's a brilliant record. Brilliant, brilliant record. And his yeah. last one, The Nimble, which momentarily escapes me, so I'm going to keep on speaking until it comes back to me. <laughs> not, not in my head, Simon, so keep going. Oh, that, I've, got, I've got it. I've got it on, on Dracula, Dracula vinyl upstairs. And it's just really, really, really quite funky and good. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just prolific. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Overland has had... As you say, Overland, but there's been as it Shadow Man. Yeah. Uh, and he's done, I mean, there was an Ozone album. Yeah. I mean, the guy's in demand, and, he, and there's albums where he's part of the writing team that he doesn't necessarily sing all the songs on. There's albums where he's kind of a voice for hire because he's got such a strong voice. There's collaboration albums where he is kind of, you know, one of the main guys in the driving seat. I mean, I suppose in the modern music world, when you're not selling, you know, arenas, mm. then you have to either do something else or be you know busy very busy and there's a few guys that kind of spring to mind as being very busy Jeff Scott Soto was one of those guys a new album coming out again it's just been spoken about the last couple of days and they just seem to be able to just keep reinventing themselves and adding new textures to what they do and Steve Overland is one of those guys where just every time you turn around there's another album and you think you know at some point the quality is going to have to start to you know, just go, and it doesn't, it just doesn't, you know, incredible guy. Cool. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. I'm going to go with number two, drum roll, please. Um, I've gone with Indiscreet. Looks to see. Uh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> almost perfect. So guess how good number one is. Uh, it's almost <laughs> It's just a super fluffy record. It really, it really is. It's like it's like if, if a kitten um, got together with marshmallow. It's that fluffy and nice. It's so ultra tuneful and melodic. That's the jobby. There it is. Look at that. Look at that hair. Look at that. Why? <sighs> Again, hair. Can't hear it, but there you go. I mean, we, we haven't mentioned Dig Digital. There, there, there's a name on the keyboard player. How did his parents know? Wow, 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 yeah. He's the chances. I know, he absolutely is all over this record with his super fluffy kit, kitten-like uh, keyboards and you know, on stage he whips out the key to he well, used to whip out the key to and that's always the sign of a good band for me. And uh, just so, it's just ultra melodic rock. Absolutely, just so melodic. Um, American Girls, I think that kind of, kind of tells you what, market they're aiming for American girls face to face heart to heart uh, fro frozen heart what a what a song mm, that's that's cool. the nearest they came to a hit in the UK um just a brilliant song a brilliant vocal heart of the matter you could sing along to these one you know just earworm after earworm after earworm god why is he not number one <laughs> I'm second guessing himself already <laughs> I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm very confident very confident with my number one but uh, I'm I mean, it's clearly Steve's about it. It's not, not me, but let's find out. Yeah. Well, number two is, is tough it out. <laughs> so, and the reason for that is just because Indiscreet's just, that is perfect. That, that's, that is the AOR album. That is perfection. Now I've had a look and I've wrote down almost perfect. You did, yes. I think you, all you did was added an extra word in there, Simon. And that's okay, but sometimes less is more, do you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. But yeah, but I mean, tough it out. I, I, we're talking minuscule, minuscule difference between the two here, do you know? Th these two albums, I, and I, I don't like to come on these shows and talk about a band as if it's just about the first two albums all those years ago, because we're, we're in 1989 here, we tough it out. This is the band's second album. Everything that's come after has, well, not quite everything, but most of it's got something really good to say about it. But the first two albums, Tough It Out's just absolutely outstandingly good. Um, this was Chris Overland's last album with a band, and he has been asked back by his brother many times, even if it's just for a guest appearance or two or whatever it may be, and he's just, it's not for him, and that's a shame because he's a, a real talent and he's absolutely fantastic on this album, as to be said. There's a couple of co-writes on here with Desmond Child, who's, you know, the famous hit maker. Bad luck, uh, burning my heart down. There's a little bit more edge here, and I can understand where Simon's coming from with preparing this, because I must admit, 
on a different day of the week, I probably do too. Um, indiscreet maybe just means a little bit more to me as well. With, with, I mean, not so much when it came out, but it's just, it's an album that's kind of travelled with me through time. But there's so much here, tough it out, don't stop, oh, bad luck, oh, such a good song. I've still got the single box set, which is somewhere in this room with a nice little enamel badge that came with it, yes. which is obviously still in the box. I never wore it. You can't wear it. You don't take it out. It has to stay in there, you know? Um, and that, it's just such a good album. I mean, I'm not going to name it all, Simon. I'll leave you to name some of it. But, oh, thanks. Yeah. But you, you persuaded me that it's the best one, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must be right, obviously, then. <laughs> in a wrong kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you're number mine. one then. <laughs> Certainly my number one. Is, uh, Sophie, I love it. I just have it's just perfect. You know, um, like you said, bad luck, you know. But when you were talking about desperation for a hit, I mean you don't go and spend time with your uncle Desmond unless you want a hit, do you? That's true. Yes, because Uncle Desmond isn't cheap. No. No. <laughs> no, he really isn't. He doesn't come around for tea and biscuits, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know like, like you said, just such a great. I, I did. Is the Jess, Jay Horns that that wrote the uh, that wrote the title track? Is that Jesse Horns? It was in our real speed wagon for about twelve seconds. Yep. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't imagine he turns up for shits and giggles either, does he? You know. No, so I, mean, to be fair, I mean, what, what label are we talking about here? CBS, Epic, Epic CBS. Yes. There was some yeah. money getting thrown around. I yeah. think there was a thought at this stage that the US was beckoning, you mm -hmm. know, that the arms were wide open, you know, across the ocean uh, and the FM were, were about to land and dominate the world. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of money spent and then it didn't happen and then the sound changed and you do wonder if the record label kind of went... Mm. Yeah. So he, I mean, here's the issue here. Ba again, I haven't heard these albums, but based on what you guys are saying... That's 89, right? Yeah. You released that in this country in 86. Different story. And that's why Indiscreet is number one in 1986. <laughs> 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 mine, mine, mine doesn't have a UK on it. Ah, well, you see, this is because we were trying to break into the US market. Yeah. And I don't think it was for the Canadian prog masters, who are excellent, by the way, or were excellent, by the way. Um, there was another US band who I've not been able to track down called FM. So mm. in the US, they were FM UK. Yeah. So why the only version of this album I've got is the American version, I don't know, but it is. Um, but I presume it sounds the same. No, it's... you've got to knock, knock a few points off for the UK thing, which makes tough it out number one. <laughs> So if I had the one without the UKs, if I had your one, this would be number two and it would be number one. <laughs> <laughs> so by doing that, this album has just got slightly better. But there you go. <laughs> Either way, it sounds like these first two are the, really the ones to get. Above all. For, what, for want of being crude, Peter, this is the shit. These first two are just... I'll go right back to where I started. FM, in my opinion, are the best AOR act that the UK has ever provided. And these are the two albums that prove that. Everything that's come afterwards is excellent, is really good. Is it AOR? Is it hard rock? It's probably both. It's a bit of something else. It's a bit of blues. It's a bit of soul. The first two, Tough Out's got a bit more edge. This has got a bit more keys, a bit more didge. Um, and it but the two of them are AOR classics. They really are. And they really, FM should have been huge. I know I say that in a lot of shows. FM should have been huge, both here and in the US. As you say, release this in 86, and it should be huge. Well, they released this in 86, and it should be huge. I mean, you've got the other side of Midnight. I belong to the night. American Girls, as Simon said. They've got that girl on here, which is a, a lot of people might know as an Iron Maiden B-side, because they covered it on the B-side to Stranger in a Strange Land, I think. Um, different arrangement, uh, but it's the same song. Frozen Heart, Heart of the Matter, will I just name the whole album? Yes, please. Not a weak moment here, not a weak, this, this is number one all the way through. Apart from, for some people, but it's number two. <laughs> two great albums. One's in the know, it's number two. <laughs> 
See, I'm always just going that popular opinion, Simon. I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> so based on everything I've heard today, so I think for me, uh, who's new to this band, again, heard of them for many years, but just never, never listened to them. Uh, I think those first two albums I'm going to want to check out. And you guys have sold me on Heroes and Villains, I believe was the other one, and yep. Metropolis. Does that sound like a good four pack to start with? I would say knowing, knowing you, Peter. Yeah, yes. yeah, knowing me. Yeah. I would, I would say that you've kind of hit the nail on the head. There. I think the first two albums represent what the band, what the hardcore fans still think of FM as being. I think the other two albums, Heroes and Villains and Metropolis, I think they're the ones that might just take the box for you. They're a bit heavier, a bit rockier, a bit more about the groove. I think they'll take take the boxes for you. So yeah. Those four is where I would go, um, but there's something to recommend for another five or so as well. <laughs> I'm also thinking, you know, too, a, a live album might be cool. I see they've got a triple live album from... Yeah, I, I think I read somewhere in an interview with them in recent times that with the way that they've done some of the live albums, because they toured however many years ago for an anniversary of this, it's too late in the day for me to be doing math, so... How many years ago this album was? In the street, 30 years, didn't they? 30 years. Thank you very much, Simon. So they played the whole album um, and they even played B-sides and, and various things like that as well. Um, and they, that's come out as a release. I think there was something along the, the lines of nearly everything, if not everything, that they've recorded has now been released live in some shape or form. Um, not 100% certain that I'm right with that. Somebody will, will correct me and please do. Um, I'm always happy to be have the, the knowledge gaps filled uh, by someone more knowledgeable than me, put it that way. But yeah, they're, they're great live. They are great live. Would I recommend starting with a live album? <sighs> I don't know, because the studio albums are so good too, but there's so much good material that maybe, yeah. Okay. I think Simon hit the nail on the head earlier on with the live album choice. I, I've always found live albums as a good into a band as opposed to a greatest hits album, which they kind of are greatest hits, but in a live setting so yeah the uh took it out live albums fantastic okay i will check into this stuff and i'll let everybody know what i think so cool also steve overland's last solo album was called scandalous <laughs> scandalous okay just looked it up there you go. and he's 61 is he apparently so wow. looks younger and sounds younger mm. not to say yeah See, That's there is there is life after fifty, right? I, I wouldn't know, Peter. I wouldn't. Are oh, you not you're not quite there yet? Okay, well, you'll be there. Well, oh, thanks for that. Not quite. Yeah, well, that's, that's, thanks for that. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not far away, but not quite there yet. <laughs> right. It's not that bad. It's not as bad. It's not as bad as people say, right, Simon? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely not. They say what fifty is the new thirty? Is that what they're saying? Some shit like that. Fifty is the new forty. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, but only guys that are fifty are saying that. <laughs> we, have to, we have to say something, right? Uh, anyway, this was th this was a lot of fun for me because I I enjoyed this because uh, it kind of helps direct me into a catalog that uh, I've never you know taken the plunge into. So I will be doing that because this sounds like a band that I'll totally get into. So. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen and Simon for uh, doing the heavy lifting on this episode. And uh, for everybody watching, please, uh, if you're familiar with the band FM, rank them as you like them. Do your do all 11, your top five, your top 10, whatever you like. And uh, if, you, if you're like me and haven't really listened to this band, go check them out and then report back later and let us know what you think, because I'm going to be doing that for sure. Um, and also, while you're doing all that, visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Uh, coming up tonight, I wasn't planning this, but um, just found out before we recorded this video that uh, Dusty Hill from ZZ Top has passed. Uh, unfortunately, we're having way too many of these this week, this month. Uh, so I'll be doing a special tribute to Dusty uh, coming up later tonight here on the channel. So stay tuned for that. And a lot more uh, tomorrow's the Monsters Den, Friday morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. And then uh, hopefully some stuff along the weekend and back on Monday with the Hudson Valley Squares. So uh, for Simon Bray and Stephen Reed, I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching, everybody. This special edition here on Wednesday of Ranking the Albums. See you real soon. Take care. <laughs>